Some time back, I had put together a very lengthy outline for what I would like to see in the perfect Batman trilogy. This was sometime before The Dark Knight Rises came out. I think it was even before we really knew a lot of the plot for The Dark Knight Rises. We may have known who the villains were going to be, but that was about it. And it was sometime after The Dark Knight. So it was sometime in between those two movies that I had put together this pretty lengthy plot outline for a Batman trilogy that I would love to see. And I was planning on posting this on a website that I used to write articles for many moons ago. And then I wound up just not getting around to it. And then The Dark Knight Rises came out. And that movie wound up using a couple of ideas that I had for this imaginary trilogy. Now, I am not going to sit here and say that that movie stole my ideas. A lot of the ideas that I was coming up with were straight from the comic books, just tweaked slightly. And that was something that Batman Begins and The Dark Knight specialized in. They would take ideas from the comics and they would spin them in a new way. And that was basically what I was doing with this trilogy that did not exist except for in my mind. So basically, I abandoned the whole project once The Dark Knight Rises came out because I figured, okay, people are just going to say, hey, you stole that from The Dark Knight Rises. But then I was reevaluating this thing. This was probably two years after the last time I had even looked at it. I was looking over it again, and I was thinking, you know what? There's some not bad ideas here. And of course, that's not to toot my own horn because most everything here comes from the comic books, just kind of distilled into a new story. So I was thinking maybe the people who listen to my videos would like to hear what I would like to see in the perfect Batman trilogy. So this is what I would like to see in the first of a three-part trilogy. Bruce is still the Batman with a hyphen and has been around just long enough to leave a mark on the city, but many still think that he is a myth. The story is loosely based on the long Halloween, but the holiday killer is not a holiday killer and does not wait until the next holiday to strike. Alberto Falcone is killing mobsters in the Falcone and Moroni families on any day of the week. This will keep the movie from spanning over an entire year. Alberto kills the Bertinellis, allies of the Moronis, accidentally leaving their young daughter Helena alive. Maybe Batman got to the crime scene too late and he accidentally terrifies Helena and it's here that he realizes that his costume needs to be toned down a little bit as he did not set out to scare children. This scene is basically taken right out of Darwin Cook's The New Frontier, although it was not Helena Bertinelli, it was a different child and it was a cultist who had kidnapped the child. But other than that, the basic tone of that scene would basically be intact in this movie. The movie also introduces Tony Zuko as a henchman of the Falcone family, thinking of going into the racketeering business. The police are not allies of Batman, and Jim Gordon would be about as important here as he was in the Burton Schumacher movies. Outside of the mystery of who is killing the mobsters, the two villains of this movie would be Black Mask and Riddler. Black Mask is essentially the third section of the mob, though not nearly as powerful as the Falcones or the Moronis. He believes that the Bat, or someone trying to mimic the Bat, is setting out to destroy all of the mob, and he hires the Riddler to figure out who is behind this. At the height of the massacres, Batman realizes that he needs help, but he knows that he cannot go to the police. He forms a small squad of people who each specialize in specific fields that will be helpful in taking down a serial killer, sending the city into a panic. This comes right out of the pages of Batman Snow. Eventually, at a crucial point in the movie, one of the people Batman has put in this squad disobeys a direct order and it nearly costs their life. Batman disbands the group he has put together, but something the group has stumbled across puts him on the trail of the killer. Batman stops Alberto before Riddler is able to figure out who the killer is. With the two families essentially wiped out, this leaves Black Mask and his organization as the primary mob force in Gotham City. Like Batman Begins and Batman Year One, this is the transition period from the air quotes ordinary crime of the mob and corrupt city officials to the more bizarre zany crime of the full-blown supervillains. And with the Riddler now facing his first failure to solve a mystery, he's going to be fixated on Batman and trying to one-up him in the coming years. 
The movie ends with Bruce telling Alfred that his experience with the group he worked with in capturing Alberto Falcone has taught him that working with a partner can be beneficial even if this group of people did not work out the way that Batman wanted them to. Alfred points to the headline of the newspaper and suggests that Commissioner Jim Gordon might be a potential ally. Bruce rejects this and says that whoever he works with needs to be someone who will obey every order that Batman gives, which was the problem with the team that Batman put together to capture Falcone. Bruce tells Alfred that there's plenty of time to talk about this, and right now he needs to unwind a little bit. Alfred suggests going to the circus, and that's how the first movie ends. The second movie is 10 years later. Batman is already working with Dick Grayson, Robin, who is 18 or 19 years old. The cold open of this movie has Batman and Robin chasing after the Man Bat. Kirk Langstrom is a good man who cannot control his transformations into the savage Man Bat. They are able to subdue the Man Bat without the monster taking any lives, though they do have a near run-in with the police. While Batman and Robin have been a consistent presence in the city for a decade, Commissioner Ellen Yindel does not like them, and spends just as much time pursuing them as she does psychopaths like the Joker and Scarecrow. Deputy Commissioner Barbara Gordon does not hate Batman and Robin as much as her boss, but she does not admire or respect them as much as her father did when he was commissioner. The big villain of this movie would be Lady Shiva. She is working for the Demon's Head organization and is here to test Batman's strength. To do this, she has struck an alliance with Mitchell Riordan, one of Bruce Wayne's co-workers from Wayne Enterprises. Riordan is an actual comic book character from the story Batman Blind Justice, though here he plays a different kind of role. Riordan basically sells Shiva the secrets of Wayne Enterprises, and Shiva then gives this information to young up-and-coming technological mogul Derek Powers. While Powers is not directly from the comic books, he is from the television series Batman Beyond, and I thought it would be cool to reference that show, and since this trilogy of movies would be skipping over a lot of time, I figured it wouldn't be a big deal to throw a character who was originally from the future into this trilogy of movies. Bruce, Dick, and Alfred will find out about most of this around halfway into the movie. At the beginning of the movie, Bruce suspects that Powers has inside information, but he does not know how deep it runs and how deadly it is for his secret identity. As for how Shiva knew Batman was Bruce Wayne, in the earliest Ra's al Ghul story, Ra's very easily deduced who Batman was with very simple deduction, so I figure something similar can happen here, though it would be mostly off-screen. While Shiva is funding Powers, she is also giving technology to Jervis Tetch, a former employee at Wayne Enterprises. Throughout roughly the first two-thirds of the movie, Batman is wasting his time trying to battle Jervis Tetch while also attempting to save his company from the rise of Derek Powers. As Batman is successfully able to stop both Tetch and discover that Riordan is a corporate spy, Shiva puts the final part of her plan into action. She uses the Man Bat Serum on an army of ninjas working for the demon head and Batman and Robin must stop them. This is taken straight from the beginning of Grant Morrison's run on Batman. Batman calls Deputy Commissioner Gordon and tells her about the army of man bats. With the help of the police, Batman and Robin are able to focus their energy on Shiva, but she proves to be too much for them and she escapes. Robin wonders why she did everything that she did, as by this point they know that she was behind the rise of Derek Powers and Jervis Tetch. Batman is not sure why she did what she did, or where she got this army of ninja that were loyal enough to die for her, but he intends to find the answers. If you were wondering, the idea of a supervillain working closely with the corporate enemy of Bruce Wayne, this was what I was referring to that happened in The Dark Knight Rises. Here, it's Shiva working with Derek Powers, and in Rises, it was Bane working with John Daggett. And funnily enough, Daggett is also not a comic book character, but like Powers, originated in animation, though he was called Roland Daggett there. The third movie, like the second movie, also takes place ten years later. Dick Grayson is now Batman. In the cold open, Batman is fighting anarchy, and a big shock to comic book fans and non-comic book fans, Huntress is assisting Batman. This is a nice callback to the first movie where we saw Helena Bertinelli's origin story. 
Barbara Gordon is the commissioner now, and she does not like the Huntress. After the cold open, everyone is even more shocked to learn that Bruce Wayne has been missing for five years and is presumed dead. In between films, Dick went to law school and is the heir of Wayne Enterprises. Dick going to law school is a callback to the Earth 2 Dick Grayson, as well as the Superman Batman Generations miniseries. In addition to Huntress acting as Dick's sidekick, they are also lovers. They have had occasional flings in the past in the comic books, but because the comics refuse to let Helena change as a character, we never get to see that relationship move forward. Much like how Bruce Wayne did not run the company in the Chris Nolan, Christian Bale movies, Derek Powers runs the company under the eye of Dick Grayson. Dick knows that Powers is a scumbag, but he also knows that he's a good businessman, and Dick knows that he does not have the time to run a company and be Batman at the same time. Alfred died of natural causes sometime after the second movie. Even though Bruce has been presumed dead for five years, Dick believes that he's still alive and wants to put more time and effort into searching for him, but knows that he can't abandon Gotham. He trusts Helena, but knows that the police do not, and if he left, a crisis could happen where the police would need Batman's help and they would refuse to work with the Huntress and people could die. Shortly into the movie, Ra's al Ghul's bodyguard slash servant Ubu approaches Batman. Batman. He knows that Dick Grayson is the second Batman, and he also knows where he can find Bruce Wayne. But before he can help him find Wayne, the Demon's Head organization needs Batman's help in something that could impact the entire world. Dick reluctantly leaves Huntress behind, who assures him that she will be fine in Gotham by herself. Ubu reveals that since the last skirmish between Roz and Dick's mentor, the Demon's Head organization has split into two separate factions. Dick wonders if this is why he's noticed that the Demon's Head organization has not been as active lately. Ubu tells Dick that while the Bat has always warred with the Demon's Head, the Order of Dumas is much, much worse. The Order is led by Jean-Paul Valley, a former disciple to Ra's al Ghul. Dick can tell that Ubu is not revealing the entire truth, as all Ubu will say is that something caused Valley to take a large army of Ra's al Ghul's followers and form his own organization. Even though Dick does have problems with Ra's al Ghul and the Demon's Head, he believes Ubu when he says that the Order of Dumas does not have the patience that Ra's al Ghul has. They will strike in full force soon, trying to accomplish what Ra's al Ghul always sought, but with more aggression that will lead to millions more dead. Dick has to work with the army of Ra's al Ghul, and he trains them in non-lethal combat, promising that anyone who resorts to murder will answer to him. This comes more or less right out of the Son of the Demon graphic novel, where Bruce Wayne had to work with Ra's al Ghul's men. Eventually, Batman and the Demon's Head are able to put a stop to Jean-Paul Valley and the Order of Dumas. Ubu then takes Dick to the head of the Demon's Head organization, and Dick is surprised to see that Bruce Wayne is in charge. Bruce tells Dick that for almost 15 years, Roz has been watching him, studying him to see if he would make a worthy replacement of the organization's leader. Roz, though immortal, was dying and needed somebody to follow in his footsteps. Although Bruce abhorred much of what Roz had done, he knew that he could use the resources of the Demon's Head to make a difference across the world and not just in Gotham City. Bruce's ascension to the leader is what sent Jean-Paul Valley and his followers their separate way and it was Bruce's leadership that led to the lessened criminal activity of the demon's head, which Dick had noticed. Bruce tells Dick that he knows that Gotham is in good hands, and he assures Dick that the rest of the world is, and if Gotham ever needs help, Dick knows where to find it. Dick goes back to Gotham, confident that the world is in the safe hands of Bruce Wayne and the demon's head. The movie jumps forward 20 years, where we see that a prison break at Arkham Asylum has happened. Tim Drake and Carrie Kelly, the new Batman and Robin, call the troops in. An army of the Demon's Head organization is called to help Batman and Robin save Gotham City. The end. And that's what my perfect Batman trilogy would look like. There's a lot of reasons why this would not work in real life. For one, these days, the internet keeps up with everything that happens in the making of a movie, and trying to keep secret the fact that Bruce Wayne would not be Batman in the third movie would be flat out impossible. Ideally, I'd want the Dick Grayson is Batman reveal to be a secret until audiences see it in the movie, but I know that could never happen. 
I know a lot of people react violently to any Batman that is not Bruce Wayne, but I've never been one of those people. I have always thought that Bruce Wayne was very important since he began the legacy of the Bat, but it's also important to note that he cannot hold the role of the Bat forever, and since this franchise would span roughly 50 years, including the little bonus scene at the end, it isn't very unreasonable to say that Bruce would not always be Batman. Much of this imagined trilogy came from the Superman Batman Generations miniseries, such as Bruce being the leader of the Demon's Head and the 10 year jumps between movies. In my Star Wars prequel fix video, I took away the large time jumps between the movies as I felt it made the ongoing story make much less sense. But here, I think it could work since, to the best of my ability, each movie works as a standalone piece. And also, anyone who thinks that, say, Robin might as well be an entirely different character in the second and third movies because he's going from being 18 to 28, well, you're not wrong, but I really was interested in the idea of doing a franchise built around the legacy of Batman. And if this ever did become an actual trilogy, you could always make the argument that people should go watch all of the other movies that Robin or Dick Grayson has been in if they want to see more of that character. That's about all I have to say here. I know this video is a little different than what I usually do, but I really thought this was an interesting idea. Let me know if you guys like this. If you don't, that's okay. I'm naturally going to be biased against my own ideas. Like I said, most of these ideas came from the comic books, so that's why I don't feel too bad tooting my own horn, as I feel like a lot of this is straight from the page, or as the case may be, from the cartoons. Let me know what you guys think. If you like this video, be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe. And I will be back tomorrow with an entirely different kind of video. So until then, I will see you guys later. Have a great day.